Today we'll be speaking with Dr. John Barge from Yale University on unconscious emotion. Dr. Barge received his PhD at the University of Michigan and is currently a professor at Yale University where he directs the Automaticity and Cognition, Motivation and Evaluation or ACME laboratory. Dr. Barge's work focuses on automaticity and unconscious processing as a method to better understand social behavior as well as philosophical topics such as free will. Much of Dr. Barge's work investigates whether behaviors thought to be under volitional control may actually result from more automatic interpretations of, as well as reactions to external stimuli, such as words. He's received numerous awards for his achievements, as well as um, discussion in top-tier media outlets. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview with my colleague, Dr. John Barge. And I just want to welcome today, John. Thanks for welcome, speaking Welcome, Jim. With Thanks us. for having me. Thanks for speaking today. Um, what I thought might be an interesting place to begin our discussion is to ask you a little bit about kind of where your journey into the world of emotion first began. So what first got you interested in emotion? It, uh, interestingly, emotion is what got me into psychology in the first place. And I have a very distinct memory of taking out the garbage when I was eight years old. It was my one chore in the house. And, and for some reason, looking out the window and saying, I want to be a psychologist, or basically, I want to study and figure out how emotion works. And I was eight or nine years old. And I have no idea why emotion, maybe because I you know, uh, come from a real emotional family but, uh, <laughs> and a big family. Um, but I just thought it was a real mystery. And uh, I hadn't read, of course, I'm eight years old. What am I reading? Um, but I hadn't heard or any, any, anybody explain how that could possibly work. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a strong effect mm -hmm. and such a, you know, in, especially in childhood with all the emotions and then adolescence. And I thought, you know, that's something I'd love to, f you know, understand and figure out. And I was very early. And so that is why I even went into psychology later on. It was, and not that I did all that much in emotion, really, but it was just the, the, the exciting, mysterious, powerful influence on us. And, and what we did and what we decided. Um, and, and also on the quality of our life. I mean, it determines yeah. obviously what, if we're happy or sad or if we're enjoying life or miserable or want to live or want to die. I mean, it's just the, the, the most important thing for human beings and, and probably for other animals as we're discovering. Uh, but it was very, very early on. It wasn't something I read a book about or took a class in and, and got mm -hmm. turned on by. It was something that was very, very early in my life. Mm, that's lovely. It seems like it was always there with you in some way. It was, and then I, I, yeah. I was, there was fortuitous uh, uh, circumstances in graduate school because uh, I, I happened to go to University of Michigan to work with Bob Zients, who uh, a lot of people know in about 1980 came out with a paper uh, arguing that affect and emotions were a different uh, kind of mental system than, than cognition, and it was very controversial at the time, and preferences need no inferences. The reason I went to go to work with Bob Zients at Michigan was because of his social facilitation work, which he had stopped doing 10 years earlier. And I got there and I said, I want to do that. And he said, you're nuts. I haven't done that for 10 years. And mm -hmm. what did I know? I knew from like, uh, you know, introductory psychology textbooks. And so, oh, okay. So it turns out that's what he was doing. And so that's what I started getting into. Um, and not, not directly with him so much as much as being in that milieu at Michigan. Yeah. At the same time, uh, uh, Nisbet, uh, uh, Dick Nisbet and Tim Wilson were, were arguing that we don't have introspective access to these processes. There was a lot of things going on at Michigan I just lucked into because I went there for the wrong reasons and just lucked into this time when all these new ideas about, uh, well, not, not so much unconscious, but about the lack of, of conscious access to why we do and why we feel and, and uh, the things we do. Mm. Um, and those two papers are, are probably two of the most important influential papers uh, since then, you know, the Nisbet and Wilson paper in 77 and the, the Zions paper in 1980. Mm. And I just lucked into it. It was just fortuitous. I mean, what's amazing is since then, you've just done some of the most powerful and interesting and provocative work in this domain. And I just want to ask you some questions about sure. it. Um, so, I mean, you're widely known for a lot of really thought-provoking work, and one of them that relates to emotion is really looking at the power of these non-conscious primes to modify our behaviors mm -hmm. and emotions in everyday life. And one of your studies really suggested that priming just simple representations of physical distance, either closeness or sort of, sort of farness, sort of being close or far, um, that this can actually be associated with systematic changes in how people feel. 
And I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about these findings and the sure. way that they shape our emotions without us necessarily being aware that they're doing so. Sure. I, I actually yeah. see that research as a, yeah. a small little step on, on the, uh, standing on the shoulders of, of uh, massive work. First, uh, first, the idea mm -hmm. from Kurt Lewin, who yeah. was many consider the founder of social psychology back in the 30s and 40s, uh, who had the idea of psychological distance and mm -hmm. the idea that we metaphorically have uh, close and far distance uh, uh, relations with people. We have a close uh, relative, or we have a close, uh, uh, a, a distant father, a close uh, mother and this kind of thing. Um, but also that we have psychological distance from our motivations and goals and, and aspirations and we can uh, feel like really driven or not uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but more recently, Jakob Trope and Nira Lieberman, of course, have done all this work in the last 10, 15 years on, on psychological distance and showing that it doesn't really matter how they manipulate in their experiments the idea of distance. Uh, you can think about somebody here uh, in the East or versus somebody in Los Angeles and it changes the way you think about them more abstractly with more distance. Uh, and so what we did was to add a small step to all of their work on these different forms of distance, including temporal time distance into the thinking about the future or the past, uh, with just a spatial uh, kind of a ma manipulation, very simple of, of, of lines that were, or dots that were relatively close or relatively far, and got the same kind of effects as these other forms of distance that Trope and Lieberman and others had found. And that's in line with a lot of recent work on how the physical uh, concepts or our physical life uh, in terms of space and vision and uh, distance and up and down, left and right, uh, also uh, our physical sensations like uh, hard and soft or, uh, so or um, uh, uh, rough or smooth, heavy or light, uh, warm or cold, these kinds of physical sensations seem to be the basis for our more abstract concepts. So physical distance is just another form of this idea that physical experiences or concepts can be organically linked uh, to the more abstract or, psych or psychological ones. And this is why we use these metaphors so, so easily that we all understand each other when we talk about them. We talk about people in physical terms or using physical metaphors. And so that was our little addition to, I think, a lot of other you know, work mainly by Trope and Lieberman on uh, on psychological distance, um, going all the way back in psychology to um, one of our founders in social psychology. I mean, speaking of uh, other metaphors that we use in our everyday life, and one of uh, the areas that you've done work on as well is sort of manipulating physical warmth and showing that that actually has these really elegant kind of downstream consequences on social warmth and related feelings. And I wonder if you could also just say a bit more about that, because that's incredibly powerful when we think of what makes us feel lonely or makes us feel connected to other people yeah. simply by physically feeling warm or cold. Um, I've always wondered about that. And in, in psychology, in social psychology, mm -hmm. this idea of warmth and coldness has a real, uh, just like with Lewin and, and psychological distance, roots that go back to Solomon Ash. In the first ever impression formation experiment, 1944 or so, um, uh, inserted the, the terms warm and cold in a, in a set of traits, uh, personality traits, that he gave everyone the same traits, except one group got the word warm inserted, the others got the word cold inserted, and it dramatically changed the impressions. And of course, everyone liked the warm person with these traits and not the cold person. But it also changed the meaning of the other ones, like sensitive uh, and, uh, and hardworking and things like that. Uh, changed the meaning of these other terms to be more positive or negative. And, and Ash argued that warm and cold were what he called central traits, that they're so important and powerful in our feelings about others that they change the meaning of everything else. And I went back and read the original work on that um, and found that he never listed any other central traits. The only ones he ever listed were warm and cold. He, 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 we always thought there were others. They're the only ones. Uh, and Susan Fisk at Princeton other, and her colleagues uh, did a lot of work in the last uh, 10 or so years uh, on stereotypes around the world and found that the same dimension of warm and cold, warmth and coldness, is the first and most powerful uh, dimension of stereotypes for groups all around the world in all cultures in 160 countries. Mm -hmm. So something that's pan-cultural, it's not just in the language and this is why it's important, it's something that's around the world. Uh, and so uh, this warmth cold idea turns out in her research uh, to be sort of like the first pass that we uh, make impressions of people. We think of them as warm or cold. And, and, and she translates it, and I think this is exactly right, as a friend or foe. Hmm. 
And you can think in evolutionary times, is this person with me or against me? Is this person going to be an enemy or try to block what I want to do? Is this person dangerous, going to try to hurt me? Or at least let me do what I want and leave me alone and even better, be a friend and help me, but that might be too much to ask. And this, is, uh, this kind of pass uh, is made uh, based on faces, based on bodily attitude, based on tone of voice, a lot of features, but it's the first and most important dimension in how we think about new people. So given all of that, the question is, why do we use this warm, more and more cold? Or why, uh, why don't we say friend or foe? Why, do we, why don't we have a special word for this? And we talk about warm and cold people and uh, a warm hospitality and uh, all these kinds of things and you know, cold hearted and all these kinds of metaphoric, but we all understand what they mean. So we again reason that this is because that the abstract idea of social warmth and coldness is maybe built on the physical. And again, that we might be able to activate the social or abstract version by just the physical sensation of warmth and coldness. So we replicated Ash's old work without the words warm or cold, but just with actual uh, physical experiences of holding a hot coffee or an, or an iced coffee or other means, mm -hmm. sort of analogous to my shower, you know, my hot shower when I was 11 or 12 years old in that hotel room. Um, and we replicated Ash's findings. So without, mm -hmm. everyone saw the same six personality traits. Uh, but had very different impressions of this person based on if they just briefly held a hot coffee or, or a cold coffee. And we followed it up by asking them in another study if they wanted to uh, keep their compensation for the experiment for themselves or give it to a friend, which would be more generous and pro-social, the warmer thing to do. And again, the majority in the hot coffee condition gave, chose to give their compensation as a form of gift certificate to a friend, and the majority in the cold condition kept it for themselves. So in those initial studies, which have been you know, replicated by lots of other people since, um, it's really expanded to this idea of, of social coldness or loneliness uh, can be, uh, to some extent, or, or, or social uh, lack of social warm feelings can be, can be act, uh, compensated to some extent by actual physical warmth, as in the shower example, or in a hot beverage, or a warm fire, mm -hmm. like in the great halls of the Middle Ages. So, you know, we've known about this implicitly for a very long time. Um, we seem to talk about it very easily, uh, but never knew it explicitly, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. this mechanism, maybe. But I think culturally, uh, we've known about it uh, for thousands of years. It's fascinating. And I mean, you've also done work showing that these sort of more kind of higher order strategies for regulating emotions, such as cognitive reappraisal. So, thinking about an emotion eliciting situation in a way that alters its emotional impact, that even those kinds of strategies can be sort of primed or brought online relatively non-consciously right. right in your work. And I mean, how is that possible? That, we that is very interesting. I don't yeah. think we really now uh, really understand how this can yeah. happen, except that these, these strategies or goals are engaged in uh, so often and frequently in our lives mm -hmm. um, to, to regulate uh, our emotions. Um, our new Yale president was at a conference, Peter Salvey was at a conference a long time ago, and he, he was in a panel, and I was in the audience, and, and there was a whole panel talking about how rarely emotion regulation happens, and mm -hmm. he got up as the discussant. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I don't know what these people are talking about. I can't go 30 seconds without regulating my emotions. What are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, and, and he has a good point, and uh, that was a compelling point, because we do this all the time. We're, we're mm -hmm. constantly having to manage our emotional internal states to, to fit in with what we're doing with other people and not disrupt mm -hmm. the interaction and dis disrupt the, the collaborative behaviors and cooperations with others. So it's something we're always doing, and since we're constantly doing it, and especially mm -hmm. in childhood when we're we're sort of told by our caretakers, our parents, to uh, calm down or to, uh, you know, perk up, or we're sort of manipulated that way. That we've been using these strategies on a daily, almost minute by minute basis for so long, they have become so ingrained mm -hmm. that they're skills that can be triggered and operate unconsciously. It, it's like uh, driving a car, typing, you know, for an experienced um, typist or driver. Uh, I don't know if this is some kind of innate abilities. In other words, I think the warm, cold kind of, mm -hmm. these kinds of physical effects on psychological functioning may well be innate. There's evidence to believe the warm, cold effect is innate. There's, uh, there's some uh, neural uh, evidence that uh, there's connections between those mm -hmm. two regions in, in the human insula, for example, and it's pancultural. But in the case of emotion regulation, this is something we do, and we're not very good at it as a child. 
and that's another clue that this is something we really learn over time. Mm -hmm. So if we did those same kind of studies and tried to, uh, tried to trigger these emotion regulation strategies in young children, toddlers, I don't think, I just would bet, although it could be wrong, yeah. um, that it wouldn't work. These are things that, that we find in adults and college students. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a different mechanism. It's not some kind of innate, uh, evolved kind of ability, but it's something that we have so, so much experience we can trigger those unconsciously. But then the real question becomes, to what extent do we actually engage in these unconsciously in the real world? To what extent do our laboratory studies, which can trigger these things without people knowing it, how often does that really happen? Do we really engage in these strategies without realizing it or not uh, versus consciously? And I think that's the big question. We certainly know how to do it consciously, mm -hmm. more, more or less. Mm -hmm. Some of us are better than others with emotional intelligence or not. But, um, whether we actually engage in these things unconsciously is a good, a very good ecological question. I mean, and you bring up some really good questions that we don't yet know, and that sort of maybe the future will, you know, bring to bear, you know, to some of these puzzles. So when you think about sort of where the future of emotion research is headed, especially related to the issues you brought up today, where do you think it might be going, or at least what are the puzzles that need to be tackled? That, that last one is a good one. I, I, it, for one thing, we had mm -hmm. some I inkling in our data that uh, these, these uh, strategies, when engaged in unconsciously, mm -hmm. work better for people who can't do it consciously. So there's some problem that a lot of people have in, in regulating their emotions that they just can't do it when they try to do it, but that, that they're better at doing it when they're not trying to. Mm -hmm. And there's you know, some, some good cognitive uh, psychological reasons for that, why that might be true. The, they operate more efficiently. It's like mm -hmm. a, a tennis player when not thinking can play well but starts thinking about the swing or the mm -hmm. baseball player thinking about their swing, they foul it all up. And you, you can mess up good things when you try to do it consciously sometimes. But as far as the general um, movement of emotion research, for one thing, it's, as you know, uh, being in it yourself and uh, uh, for the last you know, 10, 15 years, um, it's an exciting time because uh, it's, it's very important for neuroscience. It's, uh, uh, people are arguing that these feeling states, these somatic markers or, 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 or little uh, emotional feelings we have when we simulate uh, what we might do, is a ver they're very important guides to what we choose to do versus not to do. Uh, how, if it feels like it would work or it feels like it would be a disaster or if we feel sort of tinge of guilt about if we do this, then we'll feel guilty. And these people who don't have those kinds of feelings to guide them are, are messed up. They just uh, can't function too well and they make a lot of bad decisions and, uh, and hurt people very badly and don't know what they're doing. Uh, so that's really important and the, the neural and, and um, uh, other kinds of physiological measures that are being collected now show that these hormonal states, um, the endocrine system, the, uh, the, 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 these, uh, these juices you know, that, are, that are flooding through the brain, which aren't really picked up by imaging, uh, which just focuses on blood, but the juicy stuff that's going on at the same time is the emotion mm -hmm. stuff, and that's hugely important as a constraint mm -hmm. and, and moderator of these other effects. Uh, and they're, they're important uh, mediators of, of social effects, such as having power or not having power, or, or being in a, a trusting relationship or not having trust, and these very important economic and, and social kinds of variables. So getting at how these important juicy mediators you know, work, uh, which is just starting too, is going to really start explaining human behavior. I mean, it's very exciting to see this starting. Um, and emotion, I wouldn't say has been neglected historically, but uh, it's always had a side role. It's, all, it's seen as the, the irrational part that we should just try to you know, not have influence us so much. And I think that since 1994 or five with Damasio and other people has really come full circle to be where it's, it's respected as so critical, so important uh, as, a, as a guide and driver to human behavior and we just absolutely can't function without it, that we better start understanding how these supposedly irrational systems work because they're a very important component and contributor to rationality uh, and not, uh, not irrationality. So then when you think about the way the future of the field is headed and the things that seem most crucial to understand, what do you say to students who come to you for advice who are just thinking about embarking in this field of emotion? I would say uh, I would I would say talk to June Gruber first, but uh, you know, <laughs> if she's not available and she's very busy, um, I would say you, you'd want to get training in multiple methods. You don't want to focus on just, for example, questionnaires and self-report by any means. You do want to get some background and training in uh, the, uh, the the measuring the hormones, the saliva, the cortisol, the mm -hmm. testosterone, whatever. Um, 
and start getting basic training in those fields as well as uh, as uh, allied uh, areas that uh, that are very important for, for that emotions have a very strong role in playing sites, such as for example behavioral economics and mm -hmm. and and dabble and sort of uh, uh, place yourself broadly and and don't limit yourself uh, to one kind of method or one kind of approach because. I see the field is in flux, and right now, since it's in flux, you don't know what 10, 20 years from now the kinds of skills and training you're going to need. And if you just pick one, you might be wrong, and you're going to take the wrong fork in the road. And it'd be better right now to have uh, uh, to build up, especially when you're being trained and learning. Take advantage of this time. As we all know, once you get a job, it, you don't have the time to learn so much anymore. You're busy with other things. Uh, but while you have the time and opportunity to absorb and, and learn, to try to learn broadly in all these, these related areas so that you're well placed for the future, because you don't know what the future is uncertain. You don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen and what kind of discoveries and breakthroughs are going to be made and which method may be the most important or not. So don't put your, all your money on one, but, but uh, you know, build in some flexibility. And, and it'll be more interesting too. Y it may be confusing now, mm -hmm. but it'll pay off in the future when these, when these different areas, supposedly different, start converging in your mind and connections mm -hmm. start being made. Uh, and then you'll be a leader in the field. Uh, because you'll point the way for where it should go. Well, thank you so much for speaking with thank us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fantastic. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. John Barge from Yale University. Thank you.